Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about having brownies for breakfast. I'm delighted to welcome special guest, Lynn Bowman. Lynn has experience as a speaker, creative director, advertising manager, actress, makeup artist, screenwriter, illustrator, legal journalist, TV weather person, president of a nonprofit, and she is the author of Brownies for Breakfast a cookbook for diabetics and the people who love them. You can reach Lynn at her website, lynnbowman.com, and I'll include a link in the description. Welcome, Lynn. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Well, I'm exhausted listening to that, to that <laughs> list of stuff. <laughs> so, I'm trying to shrink it. What, what, what should I leave out? And actually, I did leave a whole bunch of stuff out, but I thought that kind of gives an overall picture of how incredibly versatile you are. And no, all Linda, it's how old I am. I'm 76 <laughs> as of a couple of days ago. And, um, and I love talking about that because people have this weird idea, I think, about what it means to be over 60 or over 70 or over whatever. And um, uh, speaking from firsthand experience, I can assure you that it's not quite like that. It's way more fun. It's oh. totally free. And when you review those lists of jobs, uh, you know, it wasn't in, back in the day, it wasn't a resume. It was just the long list of jobs that you had to take, many of them crummy because you were female. <laughs> We didn't have careers then. Um, so it's kind of fun to review it and think about the craziness of, of some of those things. And by the way, I do want to point out that I was the worst weather person ever, I think, in the history of broadcasting, at least and, in And state. how does one become the worst broadcaster? Did you, did you get the weather wrong, say it was going to be sunny and it rained? I mean, what makes you the worst? I knew nothing about weather. All right, these days, when you see someone on the tube doing weather, they're a meteorologist. There's someone who has some idea <laughs> of what is going. Well, first of all, I was from LA, so I had never even seen weather in my life. <laughs> and I arrived back at, at this station, the, the NBC affiliate in Wilmington, North Carolina, because I had been offered a job, I thought, as a news anchor, you know, anchor reader. And uh, I got there and they wanted me to do the weather. <laughs> so it's like, as we did in those days, I said, sure, you know, okay, um, I'll give her a go. And um, it, the first week I was there was the worst storm they'd had in a hundred years. It was all snow and so on. And, and I, I just was of no help, <laughs> basically no help to any of them. So I've assumed that I was the worst weather person ever, ever, ever. I've just assumed that title and I, no one has challenged me on it yet. Mm. Mm. Yes, we'd have to go back and check out and, and, and view this and see how that went. Yeah. Because I, I think you could still say the weather is snowy and bad. I, I, you don't have to have experienced it previously to know that you're experiencing it right here, right now. Yeah, but then you couldn't really tell them how long it was going to last or how severe it was going to be or anything. Um, really? So you didn't have information and you weren't reading information. You were just looking out the window and saying, hey. Well, I was, I was calling the airport. I was calling anybody that, you know, my, I was doing whatever I thought I could do, but um, it wasn't enough. I can assure you it wasn't particularly thorough. Um, there was a high school kid on the camera and there were notes taped, scotch taped to the camera back in the day. So this would have been, this was the early seventies, very early seventies. Fascinating. Mm. Okay. Well, let's switch from the weather over to food a little bit. Good. And we're talking, I love your positive attitude and your bright smile and how fun and awesome you are. And I love the title of the book, Brownies for Breakfast, because when I hear that, it doesn't feel like this depriving, sad, diabetic cookbook. It sounds like, woohoo, let's have some brownies. And I love that idea and that approach. I, would you mind sharing your experience with diabetes and how that's affected you? And, and tell me about the creation of this book. Well, you just said it. When I looked for information, all I found was this grim, awful sort of well, you're going to have to give up this and give up that. And rah, rah, rah. and back in the day, I, I actually found out I was diabetic in my early 40s. 
Uh, so, which is unusual. Um, so many people don't find out until later in their life that they have type two diabetes, particularly men, because they are less good about going to the doctor and getting tested for things. But I had what is called gestational diabetes uh, with my uh, pregnancies. And, and my first, my son was 10 pounds when he was born. And that was the clue. I hadn't been tested or anything, but the doc said, wow, you probably had gestational diabetes because your baby's huge. Um, so a little after the fact and a little, you know, lacking in information, but I went on then to try and figure out how to not be taken down by this and what I was supposed to do. And there just was not a lot of good information. It was mostly, well, you have to lose weight. You have to stay as skinny as you can. And you should watch your carbohydrates and try and control your sugar. Okay, well, mm, how, how do you do that? So I just never found, and so that was the genesis of the book that I, I wrote the book that nobody ever did for me, nobody ever handed me. And I definitely wanted it to be a happy, joyful uh, kind of um, approach because to me, that's good, healthy eating. It's more colorful, more fun, more interesting, more delicious. And then just the sort of basic standard American diet, which we call the sad diet, which is all kind of brown and beige and white. When you start eating for your health, really, you're eating fabulous food. You're eating really wonderful, colorful, interesting, varied food. And so it should, it's not about deprivation at all. It's about really expanding what you think about food and expanding your uh, repertoire, as it were, in the kitchen. Um, and, you know, Linda, you know this, uh, it's become so difficult for especially us females who are the ones who were always sort of chained in the kitchen. And now we're we're also chained in the car and we're changed. I mean, parents are nuts trying to do everything they're supposed to do and also be fabulous looking and fun and interesting. I mean, it's just nuts that now. It's a bit overwhelming. So it's very help overwhelming. Us out, make it that, so that it feels like I can do this. It's right. It. It's joyful. That's the kind of thing I like to hear. I think life should be joyful. I am so on your team about this. And so, um, yes, brownies for breakfast. And the only difference is when you make the brownies, according to my recipe, they are a fabulous, healthy meal. They're, they're not something you should just have as a treat. They're something you could eat all day if you wanted to, because they're made out of pumpkin and nut butter and real cocoa and very little else, um, some egg substitute if you're vegan or some eggs, if you're not. And, um, and I use sugar substitutes that are the newer, better, more natural in many cases, sugar substitutes. People still have this idea that, that sugar substitutes are kind of this icky chemical thing that you, know, you have to really avoid and they don't really taste good. Nah. -uh. Uh, they, they, they have come a long way. And so in the book, I describe and, and prescribe uh, things like monk fruit and um, chicory root. Of course, stevia has been out there. I'm not wild about the taste of stevia, but it, it works in some cases. And it, you, can, you can make the most wonderful sweets with no sugar. And so if you're diabetic like me, that's what you have to do to be healthy. Um, and funny thing, it's the same prescription really for everybody, not just diabetics, but for heart disease, for preventing these diseases, for preventing weight gain, all of these things wind up being kind of really simple, basic. You can put them on one page and I did. Um, <laughs> and, and it's no sugar. Stop with the sugar, number one. Um, and, it, you know, people are like, wait, 
just, you mean stop? And I have said this kind of ad nauseum, but until everybody gets it, I'll keep saying it, that sugar is, <clears throat> and this is based on data, this is science-based, sugar is more addictive than heroin. And so if, if I said to you, well, I'm addicted to heroin, but I want to cut back, what would you say to me? Wouldn't you say, um, honey, I don't think cut back is going to help you. I think you need to drop that crap like a hot rock. So it's the same with sugar. And, and when you quit, your body changes, your taste changes, your saliva changes, you respond to it in a very physical way. And, and someone like me who hasn't eaten sugar in a long time, it doesn't taste good to me. My body doesn't want it anymore. I am no longer addicted. So that's what I want for people. Uh, to, to really get that connection. And, you know, from there, it's not that hard. Eat whole food, eat real food. You know, when you say it, it's not that hard. And yet making that transition for so many people is absolutely terrifying. And when you're listing these positive benefits of, you know, who this helps, and we're talking about a lot of these things we think of as, as when we're aging, some of the diseases and things that happen but the no sugar, that benefit is actually also for children. It helps with ADHD and it helps with ADD and it helps with autism. Um, I have a son who struggles with some of those things and we had to cut out sugar and dairy and gluten. And, and it was really hard because it was quite a transition. Now you've got the book. It's all in there. <laughs> And now I've got the book. So I would have loved to have had that a few years ago because yes. I went through the learning curve and here you've gone through it and created these marvelous things. So did you create these, these recipes on your own? Well, most of them. I had some help from a couple of ladies that um, uh, pitched in and sent me a couple of ideas and, and they both happened to be women who were using my donut recipes in their baking businesses. Because, so that they could sell gluten-free, sugar-free uh, donuts, and which they both are doing very successfully, by the way. Um, so, so they kind of got on board, and I and I swiped a couple of their favorite recipes. Um, but a lot of them, Linda, are things that I've just been making for years, and and have you know kind of evolved over the years. But it's all basic stuff. Because the, the secret to, to serving good healthy food in your kitchen is making it easy and making it routine. And it doesn't have to be a whole different set of meals every week. It can be a lot of, I mean, how many times have your kids eaten macaroni and cheese? You know, they, they don't, if, if you let your kids decide they would eat macaroni and cheese every day, right? <laughs> Along with certain other things. Yeah, so that with pizza. Yeah. There is a recipe for macaroni and cheese in the book, but it's a healthy macaroni and cheese. Um, and, and there's some other, and a, one that I, I really love it when, when people discover how fabulous genius soup is. And it's one that, that I've uh, put out in uh, slightly, mostly the same form, but a little bit different in a previous genius book or two. Soup? Genius soup. Gen okay, so what's in genius soup? I've never heard of genius soup. Well, first of all, it's genius. Okay. Obviously. It's genius. And all it is, is kind of like a French or Italian grandma's take on what you do every day, which is you make a soup base with um, onions, carrots, and celery. You chop them up, you stir them, you saute them a little bit, and then you put in a whole bunch of broth or water, depending on what you have. And then you take all the greens that are kind of wilting in the back of your fridge, those kind of sad looking things that you bought with very good intention <laughs> and then you didn't eat, you didn't cook and you chop them up and you throw them in the soup pot. So that can be spinach, collards, dark greens. Um, it can be uh, arugula. It can be any of those dark greens, cabbage, um, chop it up, throw them in the pot. And then, and I always put a, uh, a box, I don't like to use canned tomatoes, but either fresh tomatoes or a box 
of uh, preserved tomatoes and cook it all afternoon. You know, just keep it simmering. And then, and then you season it up a little bit. And now you have the basis for an, all these other meals during the week. You can make tortilla soup one night. You can make a Greek soup one night. You can do a pasta dish another night. It's all in the book. Um, and it's all, so what you're eating now is a pot full of vegetables at, with some other little things. So it's, it's, it's about using vegetables all the time instead of just going, oh, you, you want a little broccoli on the side of the plate? No, you want to base your, your dishes, if you can, your meals, not on meat, but on vegetables. And it's just this kind of shift of point of view, you know, or attitude. And um, I actually experimented with being vegan. I was vegan for six months and got a very good result with my blood sugar. And my husband uh, went in with me on it and he loved what he got, which was a flatter belly and he felt good and so on. But we have kind of come back now so that we eat some fish, we eat shrimp and we eat, um, and we live in the coast. So, and we eat some salmon, we can very good fresh salmon. And the research tells you that the vitamin Ds in salmon and other seafood are one of the best things you can have in your body. They're essential, they're important. So those are good sources. But a thing we need to do, all of us as a country, as a world, is to stop eating the meats that are factory farmed. Mm -hmm. um, and so when people say, well, don't you eat any meat at all? If I did eat meat, I want to eat my neighbor's beef where she knows the names of those uh, steers and they are raised on grass their whole lives. They have good lives till the very last day. Um, and it's, it's good. It's not as fatty. It has more flavor. It's a better product, but it also leaves the earth in a better state. Uh, than the meat that you're buying at Safeway or, you know, the, the, the factory farmed beef, even often when they say uh, grass fed, if you really look into it, it will be finished in a feedlot with corn and other things that you don't want in your body, the, the antibiotics. So if you eat meat, please source it carefully. Um, there's nothing wrong with eating some meat, but I've seen all the data and you mentioned children and sugar. And we now have a lot of children with type two diabetes. It used to be called adult onset diabetes. Now it's not, it's type two diabetes because we're giving it to our kids. And I, I know I sound like such a granny now, but <laughs> it, you know, when, when you eat your meals with your hands out of a bag, when you're, mom is driving through and feeding, when, when you are driving through and eating out of a bag, you are missing so much of what is intended as the joy of eating. And I love that you brought that back to the joy of eating. And I think it's very important to, to keep reminding people, yes. this, this is about joy. This is about health. This is about positivity because again when you're trying to when you're coming from a place of eating dinner out of a bag from the drive through and that's what's normal it 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 can be overwhelming to think that there's any other way so i love that you keep bringing it back to joy that life is to be joyful eating is to be joyful and when we do this really well it also helps our bodies to be healthy and it helps our minds to be clear Absolutely, and it helps to, in some cases, it can help reverse some of the, the illnesses. Is that not oh, right? Oh, completely. Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, I sort of go off on, I appreciate what you're saying because to me, you know, that we, we've sort of lost the ritual of eating with our loved ones. Um, and, uh, there are a couple of generations of kids now that don't know how to use utensils at the table. Because, yeah, because they've eaten 
with their hands. They've eaten chicken bits and, and um, burgers and, and pizza. So they have not been brought up with the ritual of the table. And I, I don't think it's just because I'm old and cranky, although I am, I admit that. <laughs> but um, when you can't eat with, in communion, with gratitude, slowly, with thought, mindfully, you're not eating. You're stuffing your face with something, but you literally, your body needs time and it needs a certain amount of ritual. It needs to be cute. Okay, you're going to eat pretty soon. Okay, you're going to eat now. Okay, now you're eating. Okay, go. You, these things should not, and, and I'm guilty just like many. I mean, I raised three kids by myself for the most part. I was single. I had kids, they're now 44 as of this week. 45 and 46. Hmm. So, and I was their sole support. Um, so I gotcha. I know what it's like to have to talk your way into day school because the kid really isn't toilet trained, but you have to lie. You have to tell them that, she, you know, I, I've, I've been there <laughs> with all the crazy stuff that happens when, when you're trying to raise a family and all the different ways that we're challenged raising a family or being part of a family. And when I say family, I don't know if that's your neighbors, your friends, that's family too. And that's just as legitimate in every way. Uh, before I actually had my children, I, I loved bringing people to my table and sitting down because I was the only one who cooked. Right? I, I was the only girl in the neighborhood who, who seemed to, to want to cook. Um, but food isn't just food. You know, it's not just food. Food is what you see, what you smell. Um, it's how you feel afterwards. It's all those things. And, and we have taken convenience to this crazy length where we just don't even think anymore about what it looks like on the plate, you know, what the table looks like, what, what, what it all sounds like. Um, we're not meant to eat alone. We're not. Isn't that interesting? And as you're bringing up all these things, if we come with this kind of attitude, uh, eating disorders come from having a, a, a negative relationship with our food. Yes, absolutely. And this uh, I, attitude and direction toward eating helps us to have a positive relationship with our food, which is so healthy. And I love that you talked about bringing it around the table. And it's even more than just how it looks and smells and tastes and feels. There's also that social element. And so much research shows that this helps children. It actually helps improve their reading and their vocabulary and their success in school as much as as, as reading to your kids. And it helps with the teenagers to be able to be more successful and to have a better relationship with their parents. Because research shows that the most, uh, those who do eat together as a family, that is the time that they have to make those connections. So there's so many benefits beyond just our, our, our physical health and well being. Isn't that cool? And, and also, Eating at the table is where at least my family, I learned to defend myself, to argue civilly, to really listen, to understand the points of view of the other people who are at the table and to be able to d defend my point of view. These are skills, conversational skills that are essential to your kids growing up and, and going off to school, going off to a, a career. And, and you learn them at the table in this safe and comfortable space where you have someone saying, well, yes, but you could have said it this way. And you might think next time about doing that, whatever, conversation. <laughs> it's a huge part of our lives and it begins at the table, doesn't it? Oh, and it's so much better if it begins at the table. As you were sharing this uh, wisdom, I was thinking, isn't that a better way to do it than to learn from our social media interaction, which unfortunately is where a lot of kids are learning how to interact yep. and it yep. comes up very negative. 
So yeah. there's another benefit to sitting around the table and enjoying a meal together. And needless to say, without your electronics. Okay. It's, it's the time when we are face to face and, and just seeing real humans and not our electronics. So it's a real challenge. I mean, easy for me to say, we didn't have, when my kids were growing up, they didn't have phones. You know, we didn't, it wasn't there yet. Um, and, and so y'all younger families have this challenge now, but you have to, man, you have to be on top of it. And to me, also let's talk about, because people say to me, well, how do you get your kids to eat healthy? How do you get your kids to eat what I want them to? How do you get your kids to eat veggies? And again, Linda, that's pretty simple in my book. And that is that a kid will eat what a kid grows and shops for and, co and cooks themselves. Mm -hmm. So if your kids are growing something, anything in a pot on the, uh, by the window, or if you've got some dirt, a yard, all kids need to experience growing something in the dirt. So that's number one. So they get it. And then number two is you need to shop with your kids. You do not need to be the servant who shows up at home with all the good food that you've gone out and sort of those kids need to be with you reading the labels and looking around the store and understanding how food is marketed in that store. And of course you can, my poor children brought up by a, a lifetime marketer and advertising person. So I would always be saying, look how they did that. See how they've put that right out in front. That's because they want you to buy that. Uh, I think it's in, especially in our culture, our consuming culture, you need to teach your children what these influences are on the way they eat and consume. And the, to me, the best way to do that was take them with me to the grocery store. I didn't want to be there alone anyway. Um, and because sometimes it was crazy. <laughs> I can remember 10 o'clock at night, right, in the discount canned goods store, whatever. I mean, these it happens. Um, but your kids need to be the ones reading the label and going, you know, mom, we, we shouldn't be eating this because look, here's what's in this food. Right. Okay, good. We won't have that. We'll have something else. So it's growing the food, sourcing the food, buying the food, and then in the kitchen with you, not only cooking the food, but setting the table, preparing the table and learning how to prepare a table. And why do you do these things to prepare the table? You know, what's the, what's the tradition behind it or the thinking behind it? What an important part of your culture. I mean, if you, if you go around the world, you're, you're gonna be experiencing all these different food cultures, not just the food, but the culture around the food. Don't you want your family, your kids to know what yours is? I mean, is yours a bag? Is yours drive through? Is that your food culture? I don't think so. I mean, I don't want it to be. No. And I love when you're talking about having the children be a part of each element of this. And I also love the idea of remembering that what we choose to eat is what begins in the store. It's not when it's dinner time and we're looking in our cupboards and our fridge saying, well, what can I make out of this? Because what we can make out of it comes from the things that we put in the fridge and the cupboard in the first place, which we got at the store, or if we're super awesome, what we grew ourselves. And that's where those choices and those decisions are so important. You can't fill your cart and fill your covers with a whole bunch of garbage and then expect that you're going to be eating these awesome, healthy things, yeah. right? And this is a good time then to talk about sourcing your food. How about joining a CSA, a community service agriculture co-op, where they deliver or where you pick up a box of fabulous locally grown food every week. Um, and some of it you've never seen before. And you go, what, what is that? Oh, kohlrabi? Oh, wait a minute. And they, the good CSAs will also include usually a little, a little 
piece of paper that says this week, the kohlrabi is great and here's how you prepare it. So, so there's that, there's community service agriculture CSAs, there's farmers markets, this is not news, you need to go to them because that's where the good food is. And that's where your kids can experience meeting the people who grow the food, who know about the food and they can sniff and they can taste and they can appreciate, okay, these, these plums look really great and these don't look quite so good. What's, you know, rah, rah, rah. You, you, go, you have to learn about food and learn about sourcing food. I mean, whatever made us think that it was just going to show up on our, oh, I know who that was. It was you, mom, that just made it all show up on the table. And then everybody sits down and goes, um, no, thanks. I mean, heartbreaking. Yeah, that's just wrong, <laughs> right? It's just, we don't like that. <laughs> so to, to me, the answer is make the kids do it. And, and when they're doing, but, and I know that's not easy. I know that's a bit of a, a hard sell, but it's essential, I think. And everybody's oversubscribed. I mean, the kids are going to martial arts and French and piano and Mandarin and all this crazy stuff, baseball. I want parents to ask themselves, what matters most? What is really, really most important that the kids are doing that in 10 years, will be important. And it's been so interesting, Linda, to have kids the age mine are, you know, in their 40s, parents, and having them tell me what it was that we did as a family that they really are grateful for. And what it was we did that was just awful. <laughs> you know, yeah, but what, <laughs> what really worked for them? It's so, because it isn't always what you think. You know, sometimes you're just doing what you have to do in the moment and just getting through. But it's been so fun to hear from my kids what stayed with them and what they really are grateful for. Um, so, and, and one of the things that, that we did as a family was I, I told each one of them, okay, you get one physical activity and one sort of mental or artistic activity. Choose what you want. And one year we found ourselves, everybody was playing soccer. And that meant that I got to be snack mom, three different teams. And we had uniforms, three different teams. And we had practices three different times. And of course, and I'm working full time, you know, so add that up. Um, and I sat them down at dinner one night because we did, we had dinner almost every single night at the table, come hell or high water. And I sat him down and said, okay, listen, I can't do this. It's too hard. So just tell me right now, we have to figure things out. How much do you love soccer? And they all kind of looked at each other and said, well, we don't. We don't, <laughs> we don't really love soccer. I went, okay, done. Boom. If you find another activity that's physical that you think you'd love, let me know. And we'll look at it and we'll see if that's possible. So weeks later, my son came to me and said, I found something and I think it's wonderful and I want to do this. And I think the girls might want to do this too. And it turned out to be fencing. Cool. <laughs> but I mean, you can imagine I'm sitting there going, excuse me, what? <laughs> right? And I think it was a leftover from, from the Star Wars days, you know, the lightsaber days. But he found this fencing school in downtown San Jose where we lived and it was only a couple of miles from the house and, and this gal was amazing, wonderful teacher. And so the kids ended up doing that for years. And in fact, my youngest one started a team at her college and it ended up being something that they all really enjoyed and that they took with them and that they felt they really learned from. So I just, I invite parents to try and be creative if you can about how to make it workable, not just for the kids, but for you, you know, you, and not be any more crazy than you have to be getting them all in different directions, doing different things. Because if it means that they don't sit at the table with you, they are missing the most important activity of all. I think, 
Isn't that beautiful? And it comes back around to what we talked at the beginning, that life should be joyful and that the changes that we're talking about are not to deprive someone of their opportunity to do soccer. It's to give them something that they love, yeah. something that will bring joy, something that will be practical. And I loved when you were mentioning the activities that we do how the idea of learning how to prepare your food, how to shop for your food, this is a life skill that they're going to need yeah. in order to be on their own. So I think that's a, a beautiful place to wrap this up, that everything that we're talking about today, even though it's not common culture right now, this is wonderful, good things that are true principles. And that means that it's, it's a good thing. It's a workable thing. It's something that we can, that we can enjoy. And that that's the whole purpose is to find joy. Yes. Yes. Thank you for visiting with me today, Lynn. This has been fantastic. I am so happy to, and have you back anytime you'd like, Linda, because this is, I, you can tell, I love talking about this stuff. Um, and, and I think that, that we could all use a good dose of it right now. It's hard to stay really grounded in our homes and in our families with so much crazy going on outside. So thank you for what you're doing. And I hope we can meet up again. That sounds fantastic. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by author and motivational speaker, Jim Rohn. He said, take care of your body. It's the only place you have to live. Today, I invite you to take care of your body by eating good food and maintaining positive health habits. See you next time on Linda's Corner. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Linda's Corner, please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. I also invite you to check out my nonprofit, Hope for Healing, at the website hopeforhealingfoundation.org for free ebooks, free audiobooks, and other free resources to help increase happiness, build confidence and self esteem, strengthen relationships, manage stress, and calm feelings of depression and anxiety. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed A Journey Through Depression, or Amazon bestseller, You Got This an action plan to calm fear, anxiety, worry, and stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner.